Good evening, Twitch. Hello, YouTube. Welcome to Birth of a World. So, on this evening's stream, we're going to be talking about storylines. Uh, we've kind of set up a bit about our setting now. We've got uh, really quite a lot of information about the, uh, uh, the area of Tincliffe and our surrounding area. We've set up what was going to be our first adventure, is to kind of just let the players feel at their characters a bit and get to get their first introduction to the world and kind of its feel like. And so for tonight's uh, stream, I'm thinking that we'll talk about going beyond uh, just the one adventure and talk about now uh, storyline and continuing on kind of, that's the file I want, region, um, and continue on talking about what's going to happen beyond the first adventure, beyond the second adventure, as we move on into actually telling a story. It can be a daunting thing, right? Trying to invent, uh, you know, an entire short story or novel, basically, uh, from whole cloth right at the beginning. We've set up some of the pieces, though, now. We have um, our region here. Tincliffe is our starting town. And then we have the neighboring kingdoms of Kazal and the Dagger Shore Vale, and beyond that, Alvida. And Tincliffe is in disputed territory in the Mountains of Metal. So we've kind of set up these pieces a bit here. Um, oh, important. Uh, for anyone joining us on Twitch who hasn't watched this before, this is an interactive podcast uh, that happens every week. Uh, people in the chat are encouraged to uh, ask questions and make suggestions as we go. I will also be asking the chat directly for suggestions to answer certain questions. Um, with that out of the way, and yeah, I'm drinking something, sorry. But with that out of the way, uh, let's get back into it, shall we? Uh, let's get a new file going here. So we talked about our first adventure. First adventure has us arrive in Tincliffe. We meet the uh, tieflings living, living there. Can't spell today, apparently. Um, then we go into, uh, we save the town by beating the monsters in the mine. So that's the, that's the first adventure. That's the first step of the adventure. A baby step, if you will, right? It's, it's, your, it's your basic noob dungeon kind of situation here. Dropped into a town. Here's a quest. Go, do, go kill things. Good for basically any kind of party, whether you're, you know, a... a bunch of noble adventurers, or whether you're just a pack of murder hobos. Uh, it works for any kind of party. The second adventure uh, we talked about, we didn't really flesh out too much, but we said we'd be um, basically go up the valley to an ice cave uh, and um, clear out some bandits that were in there that had been threatening the town. Those are kind of the first two adventures that we had set up for this campaign. Now, now that we know more about the surrounding area, um, prior to a couple weeks ago, we didn't really have this map that's in the background here. Sorry, very thirsty tonight. So we didn't have this map. We had this map now, so now we can talk about what's going to go on next, right? Because presumably, um, the reason the party stopped in Tincliffe was because the train tracks were blocked by an avalanche. Um, they were on the pro they were in progress of traveling uh, either to or from Kazal. I don't think we quite decided. Uh, let me go back through my notes quickly though and see. Did we decide having good notes is always important, especially uh, having them organized. It's very, very important. Uh, I think it was this one. Um, <laughs> oh yes, that's right. So I wasn't clear at bandits, it was clear at orcs. And hey, treasure. Because parties always like treasure. Um, so did we come up with... Doesn't look like we did. Okay. Um, that's fine. I just had this uh, over on my other screen here. The details about the um, adventure. I'll occasionally be doing that. Just grabbing stuff on the other screen if I need to reference something quickly. 
Um, having good notes, very important. Anyway, um, so for our second adventure, the tracks are now clear. So now we have to decide, really, we've had our two little warm-ups, now we have to decide what kind of story we're going to tell. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about uh, story archetypes. And, and chat, feel free to chime in here uh, if you can mention uh, what are a few kind of archetypical stories that you see come up a lot. There's a saying that there, that every story is already been told, just the actors change. Um, so, for instance, this is the, the classic one that we'll actually probably wind up going with because it's typical for D&D campaigns, is the road trip. Which is to say, there, you have a reason to go somewhere and stuff happens along the way. Uh, suggested here in line art is fetch quest. Okay, that, that kind of falls under the under the, the that can fall under the road trip, uh, which is the also I, I'll put it down with that. All right, so that is need to get something. It's kind of the fetch quest archetype. Uh, let's see a few other good archetypes. Ones that you see more in movies but aren't really suited to uh, movies or books that aren't really suited to. We have like coming of age. Have coming of age. You know that's uh, So, I mean, you could do a coming of age. I've used it before as kind of a, a subplot of things where you'll have an NPC who is uh, in the middle of their own coming of age story uh, that's happening while the party are mostly going on a road trip. They like have an NPC in tow who is growing up. Uh, and we might work a, th a thread like that in at some point to the storyline. Uh, we have... Um, we have the... Uh, what's a good way to describe it? Uh... Uh, you get like swept up in events kind of thing. Um, Star Wars. So that's so Star Wars is uh, it's an example of the story archetype where basically you have the person who is rather content in their life. Um, and then adventure finds them without any real effort on their part to go looking for it. That's where you know you just bought some droids, and now your grand, now your aunt and uncle are dead. You know, doesn't that suck? And you, you know, the character is forced to adapt and learn and go on this adventure um, quite against their own will, at least at first. Um, that can work for D and D. Uh, it's a bit it's a bit trickier, obviously, because you have to D and D. You you have characters who are generally already adventurers, right? You kind of you signed up for going on an adventure when you sat down at the table. So, um, and usually people will create their characters without knowing quite what the story is going to contain. So, if you sit a bunch of people down and they've got these backstories that say, you know, this person's seeking treasure and whatnot, and you say, actually, y'all are just farmers, and uh, now the adventure is going to come to you. It it's it doesn't work quite so well. Um, there's just a few kind of the examples I can think of off the top of my head. Um, there are more story types, obviously. Uh, it's quite a lot, but you could basically classify every book, epic tale, poem, movie, etc., into a set of these story archetype buckets. Um, and so we're going to. Uh, be picking one for this thing, and uh, I think in classic D and D fashion, we're probably going to wind up going with road trip um, as the story archetype that we're going to follow here. 
Road Trip is nice, especially for introducing players to a new world, and since this is a world that is still being born, uh, it makes a nice also framing device for uh, a DM such as myself, such as any of you, uh, to come up with, to create the world basically as you go along, right? We didn't create uh, Kazal and Alvida and all this and then decide to have a mining village in the middle of it. We started with, well, the players are riding a train through the mountains and uh, an avalanche wrecks the tracks. So now we know what our story is going to look like. We're going to have a road trip, which means we are going to be, we are going to have a destination, uh, with a good reason to go there. Something that hopefully gives us a nice sense of urgency. All that oh, we should talk about that actually. So you have a destination, some urgency to get there, and on the way you meet people, you meet interesting people, you steal all their stuff, um, you kill a lot, uh, especially if you're playing the uh, uh, murder hobo archetype. Uh, which is certainly a popular one amongst a lot of D&D groups. Uh, or, you know, maybe you save a lot of people from bad things that are just happening and leave a, leave a trail of rose petals and gold uh, in your wake, although that's somewhat unlikely unless you're playing super heroic, which, is, I mean, it does happen. So, um, urgency. This is an important part of every story because it makes the play you want to make the players want to continue. Um, this will keep the uh, so the, the, a lot of so a lot of DMs are afraid of uh, railroading. Uh, railroading is direction without any direction without drive basically or forcing direction uh, it happens when there is no natural urgency lack of urgency basically um, so I mean you you have a story you want to tell Right, as a DM. You have a story you want to tell, you have plot points you want to hit. We're going to skeleton a few of those in the second half of the stream for our story here. So there's plot points you want to hit, and you want to make sure that those players go through those natural checkpoints, right? And maybe they go through them backwards, but that you, the point is you want them to go through them. You have to make the players want to go through them, though. Otherwise, uh, you will wind up railroading them just because if they keep wandering off doing stuff unrelated to the plot, uh, you're never going to get anywhere. So there's a few kinds of ways to create urgency. The classic one is the ticking clock. So this is where there is a set timeline or a set time limit uh, for to achieve their to accomplish their goal. Uh, this happens, this is a pretty common one. Um, example I can think of off the top of my head is um, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. The uh, gang had to beat uh, the Fire Lord before the end of summer. Or no, they, they had to, yes, they had to beat the Fire Lord before the end of summer because the comet was coming and it was going to make him world destroyingly powerful. Um, so that's an example of a ticking clock, right? It just goes in the background, it keeps running. You have set a point in the. F you have set a time limit for to accomplish a goal. This can be far in the future. Um, facilitate. Facilitate distractions. So you can you can set it far enough off so that the players can. Uh, Go on side quests, do other stuff if they want to, if you're prepared for that, or you could be very soon uh, to make the players worry and make them stay on the plot razor, like laser straight. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing you can do is the I hate you strategy. The I hate you strategy is where you introduce the villain early in the storyline 
and you make the villain do something uh, that the... Uh, what's Leonard saying? What about an event that the heroes accidentally cause and then have to clean up their mess? I'll get to that in a second. Uh, So the I hate you strategy works if you're like want to chase a villain um, across the world, for instance. Uh, so you introduce the villain, the main villain, in an early installment. You'll have him do something like, I have seriously just had him be a little bit rude to the player characters, and that's enough to make them want to go hunt him down and murder his and murder him and everyone between them and him. Uh, it, it's depending on your player's group. It really doesn't take much, like uh, at this early stage. You know, as soon as the players see someone they don't like. Um, they're probably going to want to just try and kill him out right, right then and there. They don't realize that this person is going to be a major plot character yet, so then when he gets away, or when he proves to be stronger than them, they'll be pissed off about it and want you know to have a second go at some point when they're stronger. Um, and so that's one way to help motivate the players. Uh, the other way, uh, Tice and a bunch of numbers says, I would love to see someone play a pacifist monk who hold no grudges, and it makes, uh, that makes that I hate you strategy lol. Yeah, that's one. That is true. You have to know your players, uh, Tice. Very true. Uh, that would not make it work at all. But uh, usually, you get more than one character in the party, so hopefully, there's someone who could at least motivate uh, to go along if you want to try and use that. But this is why it's important to kind of know, uh, especially if you're going to be playing with uh, role play, where role play is really going to have limitations on the action like that. You need to know your characters in advance so you can have some idea of what people are playing, so you can make sure that you can have something that's going to be fun and engaging. Uh, for the characters they have. So the other one is, as Lineart was suggesting, is the We Messed Up strategy. This is where the heroes break something early on really bad. And then they have to go around fixing it. Um, uh, let's see, an uh, example of the We Messed Up strategy. Uh, so that's, you know, that's like the genie out of the bottle, that's, uh, well, that, that's really the, arc, this, the classic one, is right, you let the genie out, and it goes, and it tricks people, and does some horrible things, and then you have to uh, come back later and fix it. Uh, potentially traveling the land, making reparations, or um, undoing the damage that was done. And that's actually not a bad one, you might, uh, you might use this, we messed up, uh, hook is a bit to uh, put it on the players to say, oh, we need to go fix this thing. Um, that might be the motivation we choose for our sense of urgency is, uh, um, this is important that, uh, to know that uh, potentially, God, I can't type today. <laughs> Where it says, oops, I dropped the ancient stone containing an evil presence. Exactly. But the damage has to reach beyond what the players can immediately uh, interact with, right? Uh, it would take an enormous amount of pre-planning to figure out exactly what all of the consequences are. Um, it's kind of one of the practicalities of DMing something is you're going to be making up parts of the story as the players play. That's an important aspect of it. Uh, we're 20 minutes in, so I'd just like to say for anyone who is just joining us on Twitch, this is an interactive podcast, and you are more than welcome to make suggestions or ask questions in the chat, which I will try and address. Um, today's topic is uh, creating storylines, basically, and we're currently talking about how to motivate players and create urgency in the storyline. Uh, so where were we? So I think we might wind up using this one, actually, but uh, the key thing is that the damage... It has to be big enough that there's going to be ongoing damage that the players have to go around fixing, and so widespread that they can't see quite all what all the fallout is at once, right? You know, if you make a mess locally, that's fine for a session or two maybe, but uh, unless you really want to spend a lot of time in one area, you're going to want to, um, especially because we decided kind of we're going to go with a road trip story archetype, we're going to want that to have very far-reaching consequences, both in time and space, uh, to motivate the players to go to different places and kind of look for what harm has been done. 
Let's see. Uh, Tice in a bunch of numbers says, I once played a campaign where we were all brainwashed into thinking we were good guys, but we were actually enslaving a planet for a demonic ritual. Holy crap, Tice. That is awesome. Also, kudos to whoever was writing that campaign. Uh, did they manage to like keep the wool over your eyes the entire game and just pull it over, pull it off only at the very end, uh, or did you kind of manage to break free halfway through and just like shit, we messed up? And now we wait for the chat delay. Um. <coughs> so we, so we are gonna have. So this is important now. Now we're gonna put together where our storyline happens. So one. Uh, Two, players break some. Uh, so one, intro stuff. Two, players break something. Three, uh, let's say, so... Um, Tice says, we, did, we, we, we stopped them at the end when we had the wool pulled off from over, the, from over their eyes. That's good. I'm, I'm glad you managed to end up doing the heroic thing instead of just saying, well, you know, we're bad guys now, so let's go be bad guys. Because I certainly know some players uh, who would have had to, who would have gladly said, well, we've gone this far, let's be bad guys instead. Um, that happens sometimes. We have to, that's why it's important to know your players beforehand. It was a Warhammer campaign. Uh, I'm, I do understand that Warhammer does have quite a bit of that demonic ritual type vibe going for it. Uh, at least I've seen some of the art and storyline stuff. Glass the planet. Cool. Okay, so um, getting back to the storyline we're telling here. Uh, so we're going to do a road trip that's set off by the players breaking something. So the players break something, and we'll have to figure out what. Um, and then they get the first taste of the damage they just caused. Um, they set something in motion, basically, that they are that is bigger than them. Uh, Um, the next thing you have to do is uh, they have to find out what they actually have to do to fix it, right? Um, and this is important because this is where they really receive the quest. So up until now, right, we've had just this small thing, just like, oops, we broke something. Let's go. We're probably going to have to travel somewhere to... Uh, to talk to someone who knows more than them, uh, to say, you know, oh, you did this, you have to go to these places and do these things. Uh, Tice suggests, what if they get sent to a future after an explosion that messed up the world? Uh, so that's an interesting idea, Tice. Uh, we've kind of, we've already spent some time setting up that the, the establishing kind of what the setting we're like here is. Um, but that is a, a good idea for the point two here, for getting taste of the damage they caused, is you can do the, uh, the glimpse of the future, basically. So you take, um, I, I, don't, I don't expect there to be, we actually physically go to the future, but we could perhaps um, send the player's consciousness into the future or give them a vision uh, describing um, what the outcome will be uh, should they fail in their quest. So we could give, say, you know, if you fail your quest, then the world will be consumed by a tremendous war that will, you know, kill millions of people and ravage the countryside and everyone you love will die and be, you know, chopped up in horrible ways or something like that. Uh, so that's gonna be good. that could be good, actually. Glimpse of the future. Good suggestion, Tice. Um, and that goes nicely to building urgency. Um, another thing we can do is we can actually put uh, the chain of events that they've set off onto a time limit of some kind so that now we get two points of urgency we get the, the personal we messed up guilt and also the and we have to fix it before something terrible terrible happens um, so that's a possibility um, and then so players find out what they need to do to go fix it and then they go off and start fixing it. So these kind of 
uh, sabotage goes to say, maybe they go on a crazy adventure where the world is in change by massive upheaval, but upon repairing the broken end, they discover they can reset the timeline before the world was sundered. Okay, so uh, you guys are happening on an idea that I've had for a storyline. Um, so, bit of behind the behind the behind the screen bit here. Uh, for these broadcasts, I always have a few ideas up my sleeve in case no one's in chat. So, uh, so maybe retain the memory of their experience and character advancement. That's an interesting idea. So what I was thinking, uh, what I was thinking we could set off was basically have the players um, cause the two major nations on our map here, Alvida and Kazal, uh, to go to war against each other. We talked about that kind of when we created this map, that if they were to ever come to blows, um, the countryside between the two countries, Dagger Shore Vale and the Mountains of Metal there, uh, would get crushed. But I actually like Sabotage's suggestion better here. So um, they're going to go and cause some kind of massive upheaval. Uh, uh, so this is, they are going to try and set things right as the world is coming undone, as things are churning and falling apart and becoming more and more frantic. Uh, they are tr racing, basically, to try and save everything um, so that they can... Uh, to hopefully just stop things from coming completely unraveled, but then they discover uh, that they can actually uh, turn back the clock entirely. Uh, turn back the clock for everyone but themselves, uh, Sabotage is suggesting, so that they can keep the memory of the experience uh, as well as their levels that they've gained on the adventure. Um, so I actually really like that. I really like that, so I think we're going to go with that. So let me just write this down here. So, uh, so the world, so upheaval. Mountains of metal awaken something when the fighting gets too heavy. Maybe, maybe Tice, maybe uh, we could start filling in some details uh, for some of this information here. So, how are we going to start this upheaval? What is going to be the inciting event that really kicks this off? I want to say um, we said they went into the ice cave, into the second adventure site, looking for treasure. Well, maybe they found more than they bargained for. Maybe they found some powerful artifact uh, and without even realizing what they had they you know picked it up or rubbed the lamp or whatever uh, and set things in motion that go on far beyond uh, what they were expecting um, so one other thing we want to do before we get too far ahead of ourselves here or the players are just pawns to speed mastermind yeah, Tice, I liked the story. I liked the story of your Warhammer campaign. I don't think it's quite right for uh, the players I know I'm going to have for this. Um, but we're but uh, we are going to say that the players you know, are going to be unwittingly um, setting something off. Yeah, awaken an ancient evil is basically what I'm thinking. Is can you letting the titans out? You know that kind of thing. Uh, that's actually not a bad idea. Maybe letting the titan awakening letting actual literal titans out like we could do you know, the four elements or, uh, or or waking up some evil army that's going to just start pouring out and doing terrible things uh, to the world so so let's let's um, so we talked about a road trip here right we talked about we're still we're going to kind of do the road trip style so one thing we need for a road trip is milestones. Really, this is necessary for any campaign. So after we've got the shape of the campaign and we've got why the party are going through stuff, the next thing that we need is how are the players going to mark their progress towards this end goal. Uh, it's very important uh, with a story, um, especially a, a grand adventure, that the players can tell they are definitely um, accomplishing work towards a final goal, uh, whatever that goal may be, however far off. So um, so let's say we are 
going to uh, let's so let's what is this upheaval that the players cause? We're going to say they uh, activate a network of um, ancient artifacts. And these ancient artifacts, um, what do they do? Um, what is these are going to do? They're going to be uh, releasing demons or causing the ground to break up or, ooh, I just had a great idea. Um, so... Does anyone here, this is going to be completely random, but I feel like I should cite where I, what this idea is based on. Does anyone here know the story of the apocalypse in Magic the Gathering's um, lore? Uh, basically what happened is there was uh, another plane, another plane of existence uh, that um, was engineered basically so that it would eventually spill over into the prime material plane. Uh, bringing, basically replacing the terrain there with its own terrain and bringing all the creatures from that other plane um, into the prime material plane. So basically, you're walking along the country road and suddenly you're in infernal hills and there's demons everywhere um, as this stuff kind of breaks through. How about our artifact network here uh, is going to start pulling through bits of another world, or changing the world in some way. This on it, the legacy machine, that's related to what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Tice, I like where you're going here. How about the two nations um, each blame the other for letting these demons loose, or letting the, this, catas this, catastri this catastrophe begin? Um, and so they'll go to war with each other uh, without any proper, real provocation, just because they think they're provoking each other and they already don't like each other very much. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to cause this. We're going to do... Uh, Um, let's see here. Sabotage suggests one thing about the network of nodes. When one is down, it puts stress in the others. I like that. That gives us an accelerating clock. So, uh, yeah, it definitely, uh, the accelerating clock gives us a nice, again, set of urgency. Uh, And we're going to say that we're not just going to limit it to demons or elementals or anything like that. We're just going to say that outer planes. So this is any, in the in the standard cosmology, or at least the standard cosmology as I know it, uh, this would be any uh, outsiders basically get brought through with it and wreak havoc. Tice, you really do like manipulating players into uh, thinking that. Uh, so let's say, let's say, I, I, I will make one concession definitely here. Let's say they are. Uh, so a, a demon uh, in disguise, or perhaps charming the players, uh, convinces them to pick up the crystal or touch the thing or rub the lamp or whatever um, to set this all off in motion. So that way the players, they can say all they want, oh, it was a demon that did it, but this thing, this trickster, um, I'm thinking maybe a shape-changing demon so that it appears uh, as a human or as someone they would expect to meet, um, but is actually manipulating them. Uh, come here and convinces them to do this. And then later uh, we can have this trickster uh, appear at some other point and have some influence on them. 
No, I like Tice. I really do like your particular brand of evil. It's just not quite the same as my particular brand of evil. Uh, but I like the I do like your ideas about manipulating the players. It, it is definitely a, a powerful tool you can use. But it's so one thing I want to say about caution about manipulating the players is that if you're going to if you're going to manipulate them, it's important that they one don't know they're being manipulated and two still have that kind of sense of agency. Uh, if you wind up you know cleverly manipulating them and forcing them into doing something they wouldn't otherwise uh, want to do. Um, it becomes really frustrating for the player characters. This is why things like mind control um, are usually best used on a non-player character rather than the players. Um, it's because you're, you're taking away that agency from them uh, if you do that. But if they don't know they're being manipulated and if you're just leading them into a natural decision that they would make themselves, um, that can be uh, useful. So uh, we have to be very careful about this manipulation because I have some pretty wily players uh, who will probably be playing wise enough characters to figure it out. I have uh, someone who really enjoys playing uh, wise, uh, clever characters. Uh, so to be careful that he won't be able to see through um, this manipulation when it happens. Uh, Sabotage asks, is there a plane of time? Not so much, no. But uh, yeah, there's a plane of gears. Uh, Try to remember. I think time always moves the same on the other planes, but we can screw with that because this isn't standard D and D setting, and we're probably not going to be using the normal cosmology. Um, one of the things I enjoy doing, which will be for another video, is coming up with the expanded cosmology. Is uh, um, so. Let's talk about milestones. So now we have a finite set of uh, art of artifacts. And so that makes our milestones now. So now um, you have the, uh, you know, the Legend of Zelda kind of story structure you can catacro up with, right? You have to go get the six medallions, each in a different dungeon on each corner of the world. We're doing something similar here now. There is the N, where N is as many as we need for our storyline, uh, portals. And then we go around and... Um, we close them, and every time we close one, we feel like we're making progress. Uh, it's important that they know at the beginning, or early on, how many there are. Uh, but that gives us a very simple, very convenient set of, milestone, set of milestones. So we talked about how the world is coming undone. That's going to be... Uh, And yeah, maybe this one, maybe we'll set this up. So this is the last one. So this is what uh, what chat was talking about with the, the plane of time idea, is that maybe the last one we discover um, has kind of special time rules that would allow uh, traveling back in time, or allow rewinding the clock. Um, so at the end we can set everything back to normal and return to our nice static world. Um, so, uh, so that gives us a pretty nice structure here, right? So we've got, let's get some space here so this is easier to read. Mm -hmm. So don't know, uh, Sabotage says, if we don't know how many there are, it gives the opportunity for that moment they each find to say, I thought that was the last. Is there another? We can do that a couple times, Sabotage. Uh, we can do that for the first few ones uh, before the players will be just like, shit, how many, is there a limit to these sort of things? Uh, at which point uh, you risk frustrating people. Um, one thing you want to, you want it to be hard, but you don't want it to be frustrating. 
Uh, and I mean, individual players have different tolerances for these things, different amounts of patience. Um, we're at another 20 minute mark, so I'm just going to uh, pause here and briefly say that this is, for anyone just joining us on Twitch, this is an interactive podcast. Uh, you are encouraged to participate in chat and give me ideas, uh, and ask questions, things like that. So if you've just joined us in the last 20 minutes or so, feel free to uh, hop on in the conversation. We're talking about milestones and how to convey them to players now. Uh, so yeah, I would say probably the first two or three we can uh, say, is that it? And then they you know hear about this is going on someplace else. Eventually they get to a point where they meet someone who understands more about what's going on than them. Uh, who can explain precisely how big their task is. Um, so we can kind of, so let's take this and move this down here a bit. Um, oh yeah, also for anyone who joined us and missed the first half of this, I will be putting this uh, video on YouTube uh, later today or early tomorrow um, if you missed it and want to see it from the beginning. Uh, channel link is under the video. Okay, so the players go off and start fixing that. Not quite. So let's let's get some more detail here now. Um, so intro stuff, fine. Players break something. Let's yeah, let's erase this and get some more detail here. So, um, pressure one is the starter mine. Fine. Two is the ice cave. inside the ice cave I'm just capitalizing uh, the important components of this here um, so that I can put it in placeholders later. Um, so, uh, do you convince the players to activate the artifact? What is the artifact? Um, Um, what do we know about it? We know it's immobile because the players have to go to it. Uh, we know that it is tied to the other plane somehow, or tied to a single plane other than prime. Uh, so that way we can have themed areas. We're basically doing it, to, to put it extremely lightly, we would basically be doing a theme park tour of the multiverse um, by way of this campaign with these artifacts and the portals, um, which I kind of like, actually. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity there for interesting environments and situations. Um, let's see. Let's see what chat's saying. Uh, maybe a good thing that the plane that wants to correct the mistake that has happened, he can get... That's a good idea, actually. Uh, Ty suggests maybe a good for being from a good plane, so something like an angel, for instance, from one of the uh, from the good aligned planes, uh, who could help explain what's going on and act as a guide. That's not a bad idea, uh, but it only knows bits because he usually forgets most things when they cross the border from. So they go and say, "I like that. I like that. Let's make a note about that." Um, so yeah, suggesting, uh, you know, even the good aligned ones can see, uh, can come through and, uh, be murderous, de be murderous monsters, uh, when they get pulled through because of some effect of crossing a plane like this. Uh, so Tice suggests for the appearance of this thing, a silver pane of glass that veils the veils of the planes. 
Sabotage mentions Dark Crystal. I always loved that crazy solar system machine Olga had in her observatory. That's called an Ori, by the way, Sabotage, an Ori. Um, but uh, something like that could be easily be broken or and seem to have already fix or move. That's a good point, right? We want to, they, they can't just turn this on. They have to then break it also. Um, I like the idea of a mirror. Um, like, a, a, you always say that breaking a mirror is bad luck, right? So if they go ahead and, if they go in and in this ice cave they find a magic mirror, um, and the demon uh, convinces them to, to, you know, turn it on and then break it, uh, and that turning on turns on all the other ones and they can't just turn it back off again. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, so... Yeah, it has to be something fragile. Def definitely fragile. Um, and they have to want to touch it. So how about... Um, let's see, we could do a... Um, how about... So yeah, I like, the, I like the magic mirror idea. A very, very classic fairy tale. Magic mirror, it activates. Uh, so just touching the first one, just touching it. It kind of, um, so I'm thinking like uh, when they touch it, you know, uh, you know, kind of in the Matrix, right, where he's looking at the shattered mirror, and then as he's being affected, the mirror the mirror turns to liquid, and he touches it, and it does that cool special effect and stuff like that. Maybe something something a bit like that, maybe, but. Uh, um, So the players activate the artifact. Uh, Demon convinces the players to activate artifact and, and then break it. So, yeah. So through whatever manipulation the demon winds up doing, um, we'll we'll figure out precisely what what we have to he has to say uh, when we get to statting out the ice cave. Uh, so he says, "Turn the mirror." He says, "Touch the mirror." Great. And now break it or topple it over, or throw a rock at it, or something, and they break it, and now they're screwed. And they let the demon loose, and the demon goes poof, or something like that. Uh, um, and that's going to be, that's, that's, the, that's the story bit for the first cave, I feel like. Perhaps looking at the mirror shows the room of another mirror location. I like that. Let's do it. Um. Um, that, I like that. That's good. That will give us uh, help to get through. Um, so that that will help us keep uh, keep those play people mo players moving from one location to another without having to like wait for news of weird shit happening before they realize where to go. Oh, you guys are drinking, and here I am with my glass of orange juice. <laughs> uh, um, so let's see. So that's that. Um, so next we we let things be fine for a little while. So three. Uh, is uh, I believe we said they're traveling north into Kazal, so uh, it's 
curious what you think of my location finder idea. Oh, I added it. Um, I'm not sure if you got interrupted there, but looking into or at a mirror gives an indication of, the of another mirror's location. So I totally, I think, Tice, that's a great idea, the being able to move them forward uh, through, pl through uh, the next place. So they're not gonna re the players aren't going to realize, though, right off the bat, uh, quite what they just did. Um, so they, they're going to continue on where they were going. They're going to travel into Castle. Back, basically, they're going to get back on the train. Uh, Oh, was that Sabotage's idea? Sorry, Tice. Let me scroll back up here. Uh... Oh, I see the... Angel touch of the mind. It was translate what the player sees. So Tice's suggestion was maybe they get saved from the demon by an angel, and when he attacks them, the angel touches one of their minds to show them images. They must translate what the player sees. He gets glimpses of mirrors and their locations. So that's another possibility, certainly. Um, I'm going to make a note of that, too. Uh, sorry, Tice. When, when chat gets full up, it's, it gets a bit harder to notice things moving along. Uh, So, um, I'm going to say the first hint comes from something about the mirror itself, but maybe the second mirror they come upon is one of the good aligned planes, and then they can see that, one, this makes normally benign creatures crazy, and uh, two, it helps them get a picture for uh, where it's going to go. Uh, so, Tice, good news, good news for you if you want to play this. Um, all of the stuff I'm making here is Creative Commons, and most of it is going to be posted uh, on my blog, which is linked uh, below the video there, my blogger site, um, Stone Dice. So if you want to play this, you can just take the stuff I've posted. Um, it's in the Pages section under Red Potato, which is what we codenamed this setting as for now. Um, and you can go it and take a look at the stuff and run with it. I don't think I've put the map up there yet, but in the next few weeks, I will be posting more of this stuff uh, once it's kind of finalized, so if anyone wants to take this and start playing it, you can. I will also be live streaming actual games of this once I've got my streaming setup worked out. Uh, we're still dealing with some technical details with myself and my players. Anyway, so the tracks are cleared, the party are on their way. Um, upon arriving somewhere in Castle, So we need a hook now to get the players to go um, fight an angel, basically. Um, so I'm going to say that they arrive in Subsidiate Castle, which will work out later, um, and they hear news uh, almost as soon as they get off the train about some angel attacking people in a location nearby. The city's authorities, uh, who are probably also the regional authorities, uh, offer a reward for the preferably live, because this is a, go a good aligned nation with a good aligned creature. At least we assume it's good aligned. Uh, we'll be talking about politics next week. Um, to cap to for the live capture, uh, if possible, the angel. Um, players are then expect players should then uh, players should then go and uh,
So that's going to be our third place where we really start our third session where we really start opening the story up. They travel to a new city. They fight an angel. They receive this psychic message. Um, uh, in the psychic message they receive from the angel, it contains some images. Uh, which they will have to decipher to learn that they are um, locations for the other mirrors, uh, as well as a dark vision of the future for what happens should they fail. Um, so that should that should be a nice, good kick to set the set the storyline in motion. Um, let's pick a number and figure out how many mirrors there are. Uh, so there's something like over a dozen um, outer planes in the standard cosmology. I suspect we're not going to be using the standard cosmology, so I am just going to grab my d20 and try to, or I'm going to grab a fistful of dice, because I don't think we'd want there to be just one mirror, obviously, uh, and see how many mirrors there's going to be. So just give me a second, guys. Okay, I have a fistful of assorted dice here, uh, and we're going to see how many there are. They're going to be. I'm hoping for a number around ten, maybe a bit over ten. Um, but let's see uh, what the dice say. Okay. Ooh, we got some big dice here. Okay. I'm going to take the d12s out of this because that's way too damn many. Uh, Okay, we came up with 18. We came up with 18 uh, on my random set of set of dice. Uh, so we will have there are 18 mirrors. Uh, so there we have it. We have 18 mirrors. This is going to be a long story now. Um, which is kind of good. I, I like the kind of the story that can run for a while. We can have this plot drive several seasons if we want to. Um, so it's almost 10. Um, typically I run this show for an hour. Uh, Tice asks how long will this campaign be and the answer is I don't know and I usually like to keep it that way. Uh, but now we have kind of a frame. We have a kind of a box. We could say there's 18 mirrors. Presumably each mirror is going to be um, one or two sessions depending on how long travel between those mirrors are. So this could run for quite a while, to be honest. Uh, some locations might have multiple mirrors. Who knows, maybe they're all piled in someone's basement. Um, it's certainly possible, and we can adjust that as we need to to change the pacing of this campaign. But uh, I expect that this will kind of be a long, evolving story with a lot of short, with a lot of small episodes inside of it. So the idea is, right, you do a, one or two mirrors, uh, you know, in a, over a course of a couple weeks or a couple sessions, and then maybe take a break for a while. Um, and that's kind of what I'm expecting this to be structured like. So uh, as we work through this stuff, um, in the future for this podcast, I'm just going to be continuing to create adventures and continue defining this world. Um, yeah, and we could go the other way too. We could have a full arc premiere. I expect more that this is going to be an episode premiere, where an episode is one or two sessions long. That's how long my episodes usually are um, when I'm doing episodic stories. Um, but we could always have, you know, the epic mid-season four-parter or whatever, uh, where we deal with some particularly nasty thing. And I expect that uh, in good storytelling, you want to pick up the pace in the later acts. So once we get to, like, the last six mirrors or something like that, there's going to be an incredible sense of urgency to get them all done quickly. Uh, and so then they'll be jumping between them all um, very fast. Uh, but that is well into the future now, because now we have sessions one, two, and three, and we know how we are going to dispense our main plot arc to the people. So I'm going to call that for tonight. Uh, it's 10 o'clock. This I usually run these for an hour. Uh, if you haven't already, please follow on Twitch. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter if you want to, to find out other stuff that I'm doing in the D&Dverse. Um, on my blog, linked below the video, uh, or in my YouTube channel, I'm also publishing my other campaign setting, Terra Dahar, which I've been running for a while, and that's a Pathfinder setting. This is going to be 5th edition, uh, once we actually start defining the rules. 
Um, all the stuff I made, you can use freely under Creative Commons 4.0 Attribution. All I ask is that you give me a tweet, say, hey, I'm using this here, so that I can give you a shout out. Uh, good night, Twitch. Uh, good night, YouTube. And I'll see you guys at 9 o'clock uh, on Wednesday next week. Next week's topic will be everyone's favorite topics, um, money, politics, and religion. That's what I'm going for next time. Good night, everyone.